The Word of God tells us in Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. We find that the word used here, prophesy, is synonymous with the word preach. In the last day, sons and daughters shall preach. We're seeing a greater fulfillment of Acts chapter 2 in our church and lives today. So much the more, the word says, as we see that day approaching. We are indeed seeing God calling and using more and more young ladies in these last days to make sure that his word is fulfilled. The Lord is calling men and women to go into the harvest and to preach the word of God to all people. Presently, there are more than 700 licensed lady ministers in the United Pentecostal Church International. They serve as missionaries, home missionaries. They serve as evangelists, yes, pastors, and we have them teaching in our universities uh, the Word of God. Women in Ministry Network was created and designed for those ladies feeling the call of God to preach the gospel. Our purpose and goal is to reach out to licensed lady ministers, to support, mentor, and offer Bible-based assistance to those who are seeking to go further into the call of God in their lives. Women Ministry Network can be reached at www.wimnupci.org. We have a great committee who is ready and available to answer questions, assist you, whether you are already licensed or maybe you're feeling that call of God in your life. We are there for you. Sister Melissa Frost, Lori Wagner, Vicki Gonzalez, Pebble Wisdom, Dr. Cindy Miller, these ladies are ready. They desire more than anything to help you as you reach out to fulfill the call of God on your life. Women in Ministry Network is here for those that feel God wanting to use them in these last days. Thank you, Sister Mitchell, for those insights on spiritual development. And dear listener, I appreciate you joining us today as we talk about advancing the call of God in our lives. Um, as Sister Mitchell was speaking, I was reminded of the conversation she and I have had about uh, her experiences on the road and as she ministers. And one of the questions that she receives most often about professional and ministerial development is, will you be my mentor? And um, as we were talking about what this session would cover and, and what topics are sort of hot topics in our movement right now, we decided that mentoring was one of the things that would be most helpful. And certainly those who have asked Sister Mitchell, I don't know that you could find a better mentor. She, she operates in such a balance of boldness and grace and uh, under such anointing, it would never be a bad thing to be mentored by someone like Sister Mitchell. She's an amazing asset to our movement. Um, and as we're thinking about you know, individual people's capacity for mentoring, we felt like it'd be a good idea to talk about the various forms that mentoring can take. And um, I just want to go over a brief definition. I'm kind of a word nerd myself. And so according to the Oxford Dictionary, a mentor is a trusted and experienced advisor. And to be mentored is to be trained. Uh, or to be advised by someone. That's a pretty simple definition uh, for something that truly can be very impactful in one's life. Um, to me, those terms trust, experience, training, and advice are key to the mentoring relationship. And I've been privileged to uh, be the beneficiary of many kinds of mentoring, and I want to share some of my experiences with you. So firstly, my pastor and his wife are, are trusted and experienced advisors in my life. 
Um, certainly when I was being called to preach the gospel uh, and experiencing that call, and then later as the Lord called me into pastoral ministry and, and into serving as a, a metro missionary for a season of my life, pastoring a church, um, I relied heavily on the mentorship that I received from my pastor and his wife. Um, still today, I, I don't make any major decisions in my life without consulting them, without asking for their training, advice, experience to influence those decisions. And I consider them uh, not only my spiritual authority, but great mentors and trainers for my ministerial development as well as my Christian life. Um, so first, my spiritual authority is serving in mentorship in my life, and I appreciate my pastor and his wife. Secondly, uh, over the course of, of ministry, God has chosen to connect me with uh, what I would call seasonal mentors, um, ministers, men and women of God who came into my life, spoke into my life that God connected me to for a season of time, um, particularly the people that God connected me to serve in evangelistic ministry. Um, they uh, were doing a kind of ministry that I had never done. So as I was entering into a season of deputational ministry and traveling around North America and speaking and preaching, it was very helpful to be able to text or call these individuals that God had, had opened the door of mentorship uh, for me. Uh, and um, in interacting with them, I learned a lot about, you know, protocols for traveling ministry um, spiritual guidance as, as you're ministering in a new spiritual atmosphere that you've never worked in before, um, ways to uh, help people uh, connect to your ministry so that you can minister more effectively. All of those questions that we ask when it comes to an itinerant minister or an evangelistic type approach to ministry, I was able to bounce off of my mentors and I, I appreciate their influence in my life. That was mostly seasonal. Um, because I'm no longer in that season of, of my life. And while they have become great friends, uh, that mentoring relationship has shifted and changed over time. Thirdly, I have very dear friends who serve in similar ministry capacities to myself. Um, in fact, uh, some of my closest friends were licensed at the same time that I was. And so we find ourselves working side by side again in ministry and Developing those type of peer mentoring relationships where iron is sharpening iron is some of the most valuable work we can do in ministry. Um, I have friends, uh, I've been blessed with friends around, around the country who I can call and say, hey, here's the situation. What do you think? What uh, insights do you have for me? What experience do you have with this? And because we're, we're right there in that peer uh, category, they can help me in a way that uh, others perhaps can't who haven't been in that situation or who don't have that insight of being in that situation right now with perhaps today's technology or today's situations. Um, and so I appreciate my peer mentors. Um, and I, I think that's an undervalued asset in a minister's development, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And finally, I, I don't know if you had a chance to watch uh, the the interview that Sister Cindy Miller did with the Women in Ministry Network. If you haven't, check out our Facebook page. Uh, she did a, a, a conversation with Sister Vicki Gonzalez talking about uh, mental health in ministry. And she talked about what she called our role models. Um, for my sake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about one to many mentoring from role models, from people we look up to in the ministry, people who... Uh, have perhaps a similar ministry to what we feel called to, or who speak to us on topics that resonate with our ministerial development. I think about being at conferences or even watching videos online and hearing instruction or leadership development uh, teaching that helps me grow as an individual and it comes from someone who I, I may never meet in person or with whom I may never have a full, robust mentoring conversation. But yet their work and their ministry has mentored me through the various avenues of media, whether it's a video or a podcast or a book that I might read. Um, it speaks to me and it, it invests in me 
just like a mentor would sitting across the table from me. And so we can't overlook the value of one to many mentoring relationships. Uh, I glean from those and I, I appreciate the anointing and the ministry that again resonates with my ministerial development. So in, in, in my past, mentoring has had a, a great impact on me. It's been of great value to me and it continues to be of great value. Um, it takes many forms, uh, but there's one thread that I, I find running through all of the mentoring relationships that I have, and that is the fact that being mentored takes work. It takes effort on my part. It takes engagement. I must be teachable. I must seek out the mentoring that I need. I must be willing to communicate. If it's a one-on-one -on -one or uh, a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, I have to be willing to speak up and communicate what it is that I'm struggling with or what it is that I need. I have to ask questions. I can't expect someone in a one-to-one -one mentoring relationship to simply pour everything they have into me. I have to ask questions and tell them what I'm interested in and what I'm dealing with uh, and, and ask for their expertise. I have to open my spirit to receive from that trusted leaders or trusted trainers perspective so that I can learn and then apply what is learned. Even if I'm listening to a sermon and I may never re meet this role model, um, I have to be asking the questions. Why did he say it like that? What is she trying to communicate to me? And then how do I apply what I've learned today? That's all part of that one-to-many mentoring relationship asking the questions while we are engaging in, their, uh, in, 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 in what they're giving out to us. Being mentored does require work. The mentee must be engaged in the process. And so just to give you an idea, when I agree to mentor someone, which I've done a handful of times um, for the sake of my own capacity, I can't mentor everyone and everyone wouldn't be the right fit to be mentored by me either. So with that, I've, I've said yes a handful of times, and I, I have some asks of people that I mentor. Number one, they need to stay in touch with me. I'm, I'm not going to chase them down. They're the ones that are asking for my support, and I don't want to force myself or force my experience on anyone. So I ask for either monthly or quarterly conversations, monthly or quarterly email updates of what's going on in their lives uh, or whatever they're asking me to help with. Um, and then, you know, I'll make myself available to the degree that someone demonstrates interest. So it's not enough to simply ask someone, will you mentor me? That's the first question of a long series of well thought out, hopefully well thought out questions that seeks the experience and insights of someone who will mentor you. And then on, on the other side of that, there has to be a willingness to apply what's being learned. Um, it, it, it becomes a challenge when the person doing the mentoring, when the mentor is working harder, at providing that information than the mentee is at applying it. That becomes a very frustrating relationship. And so if you're seeking to be mentored in a one-to-one -one situation, make sure you're demonstrating to that person what you're doing with the information. One of the most gratifying things about being a mentor is hearing the testimonies of what God has done through the work that the mentor and the mentee have done together. Uh, it's an amazing gift. And so before I close on the subject, let me just say that mentoring is not a relationship to enter lightly. It's definitely something that should be done through prayer, through seeking God. Uh, you know, do you want me to have a mentor? Who do you want me to work with? God, I, I don't know anyone who can help me in this area. Lead me to the right voice, the right person to speak into my life on this. And then if you have a one-to-one -one mentoring relationship that you're considering, I beg you, run that by your pastor. Um, there's often things that pastors see on behalf of their flock that can help us both learn uh, and help us help guard us from things that we ought not walk into for whatever reason. So run that by your pastor and stay under, under your pastor's uh, authority as you seek mentoring. And the loudest voice really in my life should be my pastor other than the Lord. Um, the loudest voice other than the Lord should be my pastor. And that's part of uh, staying in, in submission to the, the man or woman of God who's leading you.
Finally, I would say that I have very dear friends who would tell you they've never had a one-to-one mentoring relationship. I have friends with lengthy ministerial careers, powerful ministries in the pulpit and otherwise, who've never had a one-to-one mentoring relationship, and that's okay. It is okay not to be mentored one-on-one. God doesn't provide that for everybody in, in what we see in Scripture, and we can't expect that in our in our time. Um, but what we do have is the greatest the, the greatest amount of access that we've ever had to one to many mentoring is available now through the many channels of media. And I hope you feel like you can find the resources that you need, even if God does not directly connect you to an individual who could answer those questions uh, one-on-one. I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, The Lord is leading you. If you're listening to this right now, he's leading you as you advance his call in your life. I know you're looking forward to the next speaker that we have in this session, and that's Sister Lori Wagner. She's going to talk more about our ministerial development as it applies to continuing education and business development in the ministry. Amen. In this segment, we're going to look at some practical measures that you can implement to develop your skill set and your knowledge base in ways that can propel you forward on your ministry path. The key is to fill your life with learning. No one can do everything and you're not supposed to, so the appropriate educational and business practices that are just right for someone else may not be right for you. And so don't feel like you have to press your life into a mold that sculpted someone else's ministry. As ministers, we have an obligation to continually cultivate our minds to gain knowledge and grow in wisdom, to put to use whatever we learn so that we can preach and teach with excellence, so that we can offer effective spiritual care in today's ever-changing world, and so that we can better lead in our churches, schools, and communities, wherever God opens the door. I know that each one of us wants to bear fruit and fruit that remains and fruit that multiplies That means we can't settle for what we had yesterday, even today, in our experiences with God and others and in our continuing practical development. Of course, there are times of waiting and we are called to be content in whatever season that we're in, but I think it's okay with God to refuse to be content, to be stagnant, You might be in the same place, in the same position, but you don't have to be the same person that you were when you got there. And the fact is a lot of progress and ministerial advancement is most often not due to a lack of passion or desire, but preparation. God elevates not only on the basis of our calling, our character, our charisma, but he also elevates according to where we are developmentally. It's your responsibility to engage in preparing yourself in constructive ways that enhance the advancement of your ministry. I'm a proponent for higher education whenever possible, but education needs are going to differ for each person. For some, to advance means enrolling in seminary or other formal education. I recently earned my Master's of Theological Studies at UGST, and to be honest, I expected to learn, but I was so surprised at how much I was changed by each class, that I wasn't just a better student, a better writer, a better preacher. I was a better Christian. So I want to encourage you that even if you don't feel like you can complete a program, you could benefit from taking classes in higher education. As members of the UPC, we have access to Ministry Central and Discipleship Now, If you visit the website for the Office of Education and Endorsement, you're going to find information on our Bible colleges, and they also offer online learning opportunities. We have a Christian college and seminary. You're going to find information on chaplaincy training and other ministry training opportunities. I also have permission to share with you the Preach Like a Lady online training center that was created for women to help them develop their skills, their gifts, and their talents so that they can better preach, teach, and lead in ministry. 
Of course, there are times to use non-apostolic institutions. Right now, those are some of our only options for the highest academic degrees and for some specialty degrees. At any level of education, you might find some doctrinal bones to spit out, but that doesn't mean that there's not some good meat in a class, in a book, in a program. We've heard the warning, I know, that knowledge can puff up, and that is scriptural, it can. But if we approach higher education to better know the Lord, that increased knowledge of God and His Word should enhance our walk and our service to others. We don't have to choose to be either educated or spiritual. We can have both. 2 Timothy 2.15 is a verse that should be a staple passage for every minister. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to make sure that we're rightly dividing the word so we won't be ashamed in the way we lead our lives or in how we teach and lead others so they won't be ashamed when they stand before the Lord. So how do we learn to rightly divide? Well, beyond those licensing requirements and our personal studies, the deeper that we can dive in to truly understand concepts of biblical interpretation, the more credible our messages will be. And being credible is a ministry essential. As we handle God's word and his people, we must ensure that we are not only authentic in our calling, but we know how to authenticate what we're saying. Are we teaching the truth truthfully? Are we even properly vetting the stories that we use in sermon illustrations? Because believe me, people can fact check you like that. Are we checking the accuracy of the things that we even post on social media because it's all part of our ministry because it validates us as trustworthy or not? In all our ways, we must be people of integrity and live our lives worthy of the calling that we have received. More than having the answers to the great mysteries of the Bible, do we also know and follow the tax laws? Do we know how to conduct ourselves ethically in ministry and in business relationships? Do we know how to conduct ourselves in another minister's pulpit? Some serious mistakes can be avoided through appropriate education and training. If you have a burden for prison ministry, multicultural ministry, chaplaincy, writing, whatever it is, it's on your shoulders to connect with that world, to prepare yourself to engage in that community. Discover who is out there already doing what you want to do, someone that's credible, someone that has a good reputation, and follow them. Follow them on social media, follow them on YouTube, listen to their teachings, read their books, visit the Pentecostal Publishing House and buy some great resources. If money's an issue, then let me introduce you to my great friend, thriftbooks.com. I bought so many used books from them. For Even for my academic classes, you will find incredible resources available for pennies on the dollar. As you seek God's direction, He will establish your steps in preparation for ministry and in continuing growth and development. The God who created you to do good works, prepared in advance for you to do, He will lead you. He will even help you discover and develop dormant gifts and callings. Reach out, explore. Faithful is He that calleth you, and He also shall do it. He'll connect you with the resources. Open the doors of opportunity. God does the leading. We do the following and the learning. The homework, the classwork, the field work. And God, by His Spirit, He does the real work of the ministry. He does it through those who prepare and make themselves available. During the course of our lives, our callings change, they redirect, and they can morph into something totally different than what we thought they might look like. But your calling has put you on a path that includes today. 
Your calling is not a destination. It's not a place where you finally arrive and you have everything down pat, where you're thoroughly prepared for everything that comes your way. So that is why we need to continually fill our lives with learning. Fill your life with learning on your journey with this dynamic living God who is anything but static. A called woman of God brings a unique benefit to the church. Your contributions in the pulpit and in organizational leadership make a difference and the church benefits when women like you and me optimize our capabilities and intentionally use every gift that we have been given for the kingdom and for the glory of God. Be a good steward of the gifts that God planted in the soil of your soul. Step out in faith, stay on track, and give your best. And as you do, you will gain confidence, skills, and knowledge that will enhance not only your call, but your unique walk with God. As Sister Mitchell encouraged you in your spiritual development and Sister Frost about mentorship, I want to encourage you today to make a commitment to yourself. To develop yourself in your spiritual walk, in your ministerial relationships, but also in your education and business practices. Above all else, be diligent about your personal devotion because anything that you do that's worthwhile is going to be rooted in your connectivity with God. Each of us has to maintain that listening ear and follow the voice of God, even when we don't see the whole path that's laid out before us. As you go, I pray that you will grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord in a lifestyle that advances the cause of Christ in the love of God. You're not alone. The Women in Ministry Network is here for you. You can visit our website at wimnupci.org. We're here to help you live out your calling right now with passion, with purpose, and with courage. God bless you. Thank you.